As you are, I invite you to turn with me in scripture. We're gonna be today in the book of Judges, chapter eight, the first 21 verses of Judges, chapter eight. Those begin on page 227 in our Pew Bibles, page 227, Judges 8. Wherever you are at home listening, I pray that you also can open with us to God's word. If you're a guest with us, we welcome you here. I know there are guests. My mother-in-law was the one playing the organ from North Carolina today. As they say, behind every good pastor is a supportive wife and a mother-in-law watching him from the rearview mirror. So, <laughs> but If you're here, we welcome you. But just to give you a sense for where we are, we began this year in the book of Judges, and we've been looking at the life of a man named Gideon. You might wonder why in 2021 are we looking at an, this old, ancient life? I said as we finish 2020 and all the struggles of that year, and as we began all the uncertainties of 2021, it struck me a truth of something that C.S. Lewis observed. He said that in a, in a fearful world, what that we need is a fearless church. In a fearful world like ours, we need a fearless church. And Gideon is a story that helps us live into that. As one scholar says, the story of Gideon focuses on the struggle to overcome fear. So for six weeks, we've walked with Gideon and we've seen that struggle to overcome fear. The very first time we met him, he was hiding in a wine press because he was afraid of his enemies. The next time we saw that he was afraid, not knowing who was speaking to him and asking God for a sign to confirm that it was actually God. The next time we saw that he was charged to do before a battle with the outside enemies to do a battle with the idolatry in his own family. And he did that at night because he was afraid. The next Sunday, we saw that he again asked God not just for one, but for two more signs to confirm that God's mission was actually true. And then the last time we were together, we saw on the eve of the battle, he was still afraid and God had to give him yet one more sign through the dream of his enemy. And yet at the end of that sermon, we saw that this man who had struggled with fear had not only conquered the enemy without, the Midianites, but he had also by grace conquered the enemy within. He had overcome his fear. And I wanted to maybe end the story of Gideon on that high note. We like to end there because we all like to end with a happy ending. And also chronologically it makes sense because now we're beginning a season of Lent and typically in a new season we begin a new sermon series. But I couldn't leave Gideon on that high note. I say that because the Bible does, and the Bible goes on with his story, and if every part of scripture is God-breathed, we need to listen to what God is telling us. But also, I couldn't leave Gideon on that high note and enter into Lent, because Lent is a reminder to us that life isn't lived on the high notes. So I was doing research on Gideon, I came across this book for children on Amazon. It's called The Heroes and the Villains of the Bible. And it reads the Bible looking at who are the good guys, the heroes, and who are the bad guys, the villains. And you'll see there's a hero on the front. Does anyone see who that hero is? It's holding a a trumpet and a torch. Who would it be? Gideon. Gideon is one of those heroes. The description of the book on Amazon said this. The Bible is packed with stories of courageous people who loved and served God. It's also filled with villainous people who disobeyed God and did horrible things. Heroes and villains of the Bible encourages its readers to aspire to become great, courageous, and heroic servants of God and to reject all that is evil in the world. We want you, friends, to be heroes, not villains. We want you to be Gideons, those heroic, courageous people, not like the villains who weren't like that. And that's a great way to view the Bible and that's the way we could view it if we ended the story of Gideon on the high note, but that of course is not the actual story of the Bible and it's certainly not the story of Gideon. In our first sermon, I quoted F.F. Bruce who said this about Gideon. Gideon is at once the greatest individual hero of the epic and its most tragic figure. The Bible isn't filled with heroes and villains, it's filled with human beings. Broken people who need a savior. And so for the first three Sundays of Lent, we're gonna continue with Gideon, but we're not gonna be seeing his triumph, we're gonna be seeing his frailty and his failure, that he, like us, is a human being in need of a savior. And as we journey to the cross, I pray that that is the message that God teaches each of us. With that before us, would you please pray with me for God to speak? Heavenly Father, as we journey to the cross on the second Sunday of Lent, We do so with a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. A cloud of witnesses made up not simply of 
heroes who did the right thing in all occasions and always knew what to do, but a broken people who are a cloud of witnesses today only because of your grace to them. And the message they shout, the encouragement that they give to us today is not to lean on our own strength and abilities, but as broken people in a broken world, to lean on you, the one who is strong, the one who is our savior. And so, Lord, we pray by your spirit and word that you would speak to us today, for we pray as your people listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Judges chapter eight, verses one through 21. Now the Ephraimites asked Gideon, why have you treated us like this? Why didn't you call us when you went to fight Midian? And they criticized him sharply. But he answered them, what have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't the gleanings of Ephraim's grapes better than the full grape harvest of Abazer? God gave Oreb and Zeb, the Midianite leaders, into your hands. What was I able to do compared to you? At this, their resentment against him subsided. Gideon and his 300 men, exhausted yet keeping up the pursuit, came to the Jordan and crossed it. He said to the man of Sukkot, Give my troops some bread, they are worn out, and I am still presuming Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. But the officials of Sukkot said, Do you already have the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna in your possession? Why should we, we give bread to your troops? Then Gideon replied, just for that, when the Lord gives Zeba and Zalmunna into my hands, I will tear your flesh with desert thorns and briars. From there he went on to Peniel and made the same request of them, and they answered as the men of Sukkot had. So he said to the men of Peniel, when I return in triumph, I will tear down this tower. Now Zeba and Zalmunna were in Karkor with a force of about 15,000 men. All that were left of the armies of the eastern people, 120,000 swordsmen had fallen. Gideon went up by the route of the nomads east of Noba and Jogbeha and fell upon the unsuspecting army. Zeba and Zalmunna, the two kings of Midian, fled, and he pursued them and captured them, routing their entire army. Gideon, son of Joash, then returned from the battle by the pass of Harris. He caught a young man of Sukkot and questioned him, and the young man wrote down for him all the names of the 77 officials of Sukkot, the elders of the town. Then Gideon came and said to the men of Sukkot, here are Zeba and Zalmunna, about whom you taunted me by saying, do you already have the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna in your possession? Why should we give bread to your exhausted men? He took the elders of the town and taught the men of Sukkot a lesson by punishing them with desert thorns and briars, he also pulled down the tower of Peniel and killed the men of the town. Then he asked Zeba and Zalmunna, what kind of men did you kill at Tabor? Men like you, they answered, each one with the bearing of a prince. Gideon replied, those were my brothers, the sons of my own mother. As surely as the Lord lives, if you had spared their lives, I would not kill you. Turning to Jether, his oldest son, he said, kill them. But Jether did not draw his sword because he was only a boy and was afraid. Zeba and Zamuna said, come do it yourself. As is the man, so is his strength. So Gideon stepped forward and killed them. And he took the ornaments off their camels' necks. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, I'd like to begin with a question today. When you've just won a great victory, what do you do next? When you've just won the battle, you've just triumphed in the war, you are standing at the summit of success, and there's no more way to go up, what do you do next when you've just triumphed? It's an interesting question, we see examples of how people answer it. Earlier this month, at the Super Bowl, Tom Brady competed in his record-setting 10th Super Bowl, he won his seventh Super Bowl. He was named MVP for the fifth time in a Super Bowl, shattering all kinds of records, clearly the greatest of all time. That is Tom Brady. But when you just won the Super Bowl for the seventh time and been named MVP for the fifth time, and there's nowhere to go but up, what do you do after a great triumph? Well, let's see what Tom Brady did. Or, 
or not yet? I can just paraphrase it if I need to, Mary Jo, just give me a thumbs up if that's what I need to do. There we go. You and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have just won the Super Bowl. What are you going to do next? For 34 years, you've just won the Super Bowl, and every champion's been asked the question, what are you going to do next? And what's the answer? I'm going to Disney World. I'm going to relax. I'm going to the happily ever after. That's what you do when you've just won a victory. Gideon has just won that triumphant victory. He is with 300 men, defeated 132,000. He is the MVP. But what we see in the rest of his story is not a man who gets to go to Disney World, but rather a man who walks a very dangerous road. Not a man who goes to the magic kingdom, but a man who finds himself in a tragic kingdom. And what we're gonna see in this story is unlike our aspirations for our heroes, sometimes our most dangerous battles follow our greatest victories. Sometimes our most dangerous battles follow our greatest victories. If the first part of Gideon's story was showing us God's power perfected in weakness, the rest of the story shows the danger of our strength. That is what we're gonna see as we journey to the cross in the story of Gideon. Now to put us where we were, at the end of the story last week, God had won the victory, but Gideon was given the call to do the mopping up. So in chapter seven, verse 24, we read this. Now Gideon sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim saying, come down against the Midianites and seize the waters of the Jordan ahead of them as far as Beth Barah. And so he's asking other people, look, the enemy is fleeing. I want you to take the place where they're gonna try to escape and help me. So he calls Ephraim up and they do just that and they capture the two princes of Midian. They cut off their heads and they bring them to Gideon. That's how the story ended last time. But now Gideon is experiencing some friendly fire. Because that very tribe that's just helped him is now angry that they didn't get to help him earlier. Eight, verse one. Now the Ephraimites ask Gideon, why have you treated us like this? Why didn't you call us up when you went out to fight Midian? And they criticized him sharply. The Hebrew there is, is they really, they, they rebuked him fiercely. They are angry at him, even after he's just won a great victory. Friendly fire. Now this is very unfair to Gideon, but Gideon responds, with great tact and diplomacy. As as good as he was as a man on the battlefield, he is as a diplomat off. Notice his response to the Ephraimites. In four different ways, he pacifies them. He answers them, what have I accomplished compared to you? So he's self-deprecating. Number two, he gives a proverb. Aren't the gleanings of Ephraim's grapes better than the full grape harvest of Abiezar? In other words, he's saying, your worst is better than my tribe's best. Thirdly, he says, and God gave you the real trophy. You got to capture the two princes. And then fourthly, what was I able to do compared to you? Again, self-deprecating. In four different ways, he plies his diplomacy, and at the end, they are persuaded, and they are at peace. So this is how the story goes. This is really an example of Proverbs chapter 15, a gentle answer turns away wrath. But what's ironic is even though a gentle answer has just turned away wrath, the rest of the story is driven by wrath. Something happens in chapter eight that does something to Gideon. And what many scholars say happened is he crosses a line both geographically and spiritually. Verse four, Gideon and his 300 men, exhausted yet keeping up the pursuit, came to the Jordan. So they come to the barrier, this Jordan River, and they crossed it. Now Gideon was called to drive the Midianites out of Israel. He has just won a great victory, 120,000 of them are dead, their two princes are beheaded, they're flying back home, but Gideon doesn't get to the Jordan and stop, he continues to pursue them. And we'll see he's driven by something other than God. One scholar says this, 
The narration continues, and the portrayal of Gideon becomes bleaker and bleaker. The moment that he and his men cross the Jordan, a whole new Gideon emerges. We see that new Gideon in the way that he interacts, first of all, with his own countrymen. Notice how he reacted to the Ephraimites when they were criticizing him. Now notice how he reacts to other of his tribe or his people. First of all, he asked a very understandable request. He said to the men of Sukkot, give my troops some bread. They are worn out and we're still pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna. Now, Gideon has, if you know the map of Israel, he has been pursuing Midian now for 40 miles by the time he gets to Sukkot. Imagine running 40 miles. Imagine fighting, and now you know you need to go several hundred more miles to catch up with the Midianites, and when you get there, you have to fight them yet. And you're still outnumbered 50 to one. There's 15,000 of them, 300 of you. He says, we need some help here. And what's their response? The officials of Sukkot said, do you already have these people in your hands? No, you don't, so why should we give bread to your troops? Now this is a harsh rebuke, but it's understandable. Sukkot is on the east side of the Jordan. They are on the side where Midian is. Gideon has 300 exhausted men. Midian still has 15,000. The men of Sukkot realize this is a 50 to 1 ratio. Gideon likely isn't going to win, and if he loses but they helped him, the Midianites are going to now punish them. Their lives are at stake. They are as fearful as as Gideon has been. So they refuse. But Gideon doesn't respond with diplomacy. Her understanding saying, look, I've been afraid myself, but trust me, God will help us. No, Gideon responds now with a threat. The Gideon replied, just for that, when the Lord has given Zeba and Zalmunna into my hands, I will tear your flesh with desert thorns and briars. He goes six miles further on, he comes to another Israelite town, asks them the same thing. They respond with the same rebuke of him, and he again responds with a threat of retribution. I will t- when I return in triumph, I will tear down this tower. Do you notice what's going on? One scholar says this, Gideon's humility and caution completely disappear. He now throws diplomacy to the wind, demanding support with threats of retribution on those who fail to give it. And in marked contrast to the earlier phase of Gideon's career, there is no longer any reference to the Lord being involved in what he does. It is clear that what he now achieves is by his own strength of character and tactical skill, not by reliance upon the Lord. Tim Keller says this, Gideon's need for respect and honor and his violent, bitter rage when he fails to be given what he thinks he deserves shows that his success in battle has been the worst thing for him. Sometimes our greatest battles follow our greatest triumphs. So Gideon has crossed the Jordan in his own strength. He is now filled with the rage against anyone who doesn't support him. He finds the Midianites. They are now unsuspected because they're back in their homeland. They expect no one would possibly follow them. Once again, he surprises them. He falls upon them. They run away. He captures the two men. He wins another victory. But rather than a victory lap and going to Disney World, what he does is a lap of revenge, escalating revenge. Notice, he returns first of all to Sukkot. He gets all the names of the elders, 77. He writes down the names of his enemies just so he can make sure he gets every single one of them. And then he punishes them with desert thorns and briars. And then he goes to Peniel. Before he had just tortured people, now he tears down their tower. These are Israelites. He destroys their defenses. And then he kills the men of the town. He murders his own people. He goes from torture to destruction to murder. But then we see what's been driving this whole crusade is he interacts with these two captured kings. Then he asks Ziba and Zamuna, what kind of men did you kill at Tabor? Now that wasn't where the battle was. This must have been an earlier battle. And they respond, people just like you, each one with the bearing of a prince. In other words, they looked like you. And Gideon replied, and this is the, the truth, those were my brothers, the sons of my mother. He, in his earlier life, had brothers who had been killed by these two men. And he has just now pursued them to the ends of the earth. He has captured them. And now what is he going to do? He said, if you had spared them, I would spare you. But since you didn't spare them, he turns to his son and he says, kill them. This entire crossing of the Jordan had nothing to do with God and everything to do with Gideon and vengeance. One scholar says this, 
At length, Gideon's motivation is revealed, revenge. Ziba and Zalmunna had been responsible for the death of his brothers. This is a personal vendetta that Gideon has been persecuting with such ruthless determination. Ziba and Zalmunna are executed, not because they are enemies of Yahweh, but because of Gideon's personal vengeance. We see a transformation here. Gideon has turned from a coward to a courageous hero, but he has also moved from dependency on God to self-sufficiency. From humility, saying, I'm the least of my tribe, to pride, and from diplomacy to vengeance. What we see in Gideon is a mission of personal vengeance. Now, if we read the Bible as heroes and villains, we don't know what to do with that. This is uncomfortable, and yet I believe it's understandable. We know what it's like for people to be on a mission of personal vengeance. My wife and I, in the summer months, like to go up, if we ever have a, a free day, to the Palisades. Anyone ever been to Palisades State Park? Garrett's in South Dakota, that area? At Garrett's in South Dakota, beautiful rock formations, there is a cliff, and over that cliff there is a metal footbridge, and that gap, does anyone know what that's called? Devil's Gulch? Does anyone know what the famous historical event that happened at Devil's Gulch is? Anyone go up there and even know what happened? Jesse James. Jesse James was pursued by the largest posse in U.S. history on his horse, and he jumped Devil's Gulch. Now, what was De- Jesse James doing in Garrett's in South Dakota? Well, he was coming back from Minnesota. What was he doing in Minnesota? Well, it wasn't sports teams he was cheering for. That's not what he was doing. He was in Northfield, Minnesota to rob a bank. Now, why was Jesse James in Northfield, Minnesota? He was based in Missouri. This is 500 miles from his home. He is a long way. He's to the end of the earth. Why did he go to Northfield, Minnesota to rob that bank? Well, that bank had funds, and in fact, one of the owners was a man who had fought against him in the Civil War. Jesse James was a Confederate, and his gang of of criminals were Confederate veterans. The person who owned this bank was a union general. His name was Elder Ames. And Adelbert Ames not only was a union general, after the war he had become a governor when the union was trying to change the South and he had been sent to Mississippi and assigned to be the governor of Mississippi. And while he was there, he pursued a new war. This is what he said. This is Adelbert Ames' words. To buckle on my armor knew that I may better fight the battle of the poor and oppressed colored man. He was trying to make the whites accept the blacks. Jesse James, a Confederate, had lost the first war to the Union, but he also resented losing this other war of seeing blacks being put in places of power against whites. And so he made his way to Northfield, Minnesota, not just to rob money, to rob a bank, but to rob Alderber... Um, Ames Bank, this was a mission of vengeance. It went wrong, people were killed, and as he was fleeing, he jumped Devil's Gulch, which is a great name for that, because this was a mission of the devil. This was retribution, revenge. Now those sort of things can make history, but I think we in our own life know other ways in which revenge finds its way into how we interact with one another. Often it's in little small ways. Sometimes simply in the relationships that we have of romance. I saw this recently, um, this is on Twitter. My boyfriend cheated on me so I convinced him to get matching tattoos. He went first, I went home. Revenge, right? If not, with people that we are dating, we can also do it with other people in our life. For example, our children. This is another tweet. tweet. Um, It's her summer break, so I wake my 12-year-old daughter at 5.15 in the morning. I've been waiting for this revenge since she was four. When she asked me why I woke her up, I told her my blanket fell off the bed. (laughs) Parental revenge. We can do this with those that we live with, our roommates. One roommate had tricked his roommates into eating dog food by telling them it was beef jerky. He went home for the weekend, and when he came back, his entire room was wrapped in two kilometers of saran wrap. Sweet revenge. We also do this even with the coworkers who eat our food, like this person who was injecting spicy mustard into the donuts that she knew her coworker was gonna steal from her. Revenge. 
And if you're not so creative to get that kind of revenge as these people, you can just pay people who will do it for you. This Valentine's Day, earlier this month, in Texas, you could actually pay money to the zoo in Texas, and they would name a cockroach after your ex. If that's not bad enough, there's something even worse. In Lexington, Kentucky, the Humane Society would let you pay money for the, your ex's name to be put in the litter box for cats to do their business on doing their number two on your former number one. It was a smear campaign, actually. (laughs) Now that is the lowest of the low, right? But you'll notice the name of the headline here, Dumps for the Dumped, Kentucky Shelter Kitties Will Help You Get Some So, Not So Sweet Revenge Against Your Ex. You notice the phrase there, we get our sweet revenge. That's because studies have shown when they've had people contemplate doing revenge, a, a group of Swiss researchers had people do a game where they were cheated by someone else, and then they were given an opportunity to punish that person, to get their revenge, and they took brain scans. Do you know the part of the brains that lit up during their time of revenge? The same parts that light up when you eat chocolate, the pleasure centers. Getting your sweet revenge, we enjoy doing it. It is biological. And if you've ever pursued a mission, mission of revenge like Jesse James, you know very rarely does it end with sweetness. In fact, those same scientists found although you get that shot of pleasure, it doesn't last. And in fact, you feel worse after committing revenge than you do before. Revenge seems to promise sweetness, but it never delivers it. Why is that? Well, I think because revenge is not just biological or a spiritual desire for justice. Revenge is also rooted in sin, and the wages of sin is always death. What I mean by being rooted in sin, I would say this, that revenge is rooted in a distorted sense of self-worth. When you want justice, that comes from a healthy sense of self-worth. That's a sense of recognizing that I am valuable and you have harmed me, so you have done something that should not have been done. You have done something wrong to me. That is justice. But revenge moves from saying you've done me wrong to saying and I'm the one to make it right. Revenge is a perverse inversion of Romans 12. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, says God. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Revenge is us saying to God, I don't believe that. It is mine, God, not yours to repay. I will avenge, I am the Lord. Revenge, unlike justice, comes from a distorted sense of self, which is exactly what we see happening in Gideon. Gideon has crossed the Jordan. He has ceased to do the work of God. He is now on a crusade, a mission of revenge. And as he catches up with these two men that he has been hunting down, notice this unique interchange with them. We see, and as we do that, we see that revenge is ultimately a rejection of God's grace. He says, but Jether, his son, does not draw his sword to kill because he was only a boy and he was afraid. Now this is, scholars say, a foil. The apple hasn't fallen far from the tree. Gideon, who was always afraid, now has a firstborn who was also afraid. But as we read the story, it's the firstborn son, Jether, who is the more attractive figure, showing that Gideon was actually better before than he is now. And then notice what the response of the kings are. They say to him, come do it yourself. As is the man, so is his strength. You could paraphrase that. Be a man, do it yourself. Do it in your strength. Which is exactly, of course, the lesson that God has been telling him is the wrong one. Everything we've seen up to now is God saying, don't do it in your strength. And yet now in vengeance, Gideon loses that lesson and does exactly what they call him to do. He executes vengeance in his own strength. As is the man, so is the strength. That is vengeance. And as such, it is a repudiation, a rejection of God's grace. That is what revenge is at essence. It is a rejection of God's grace. One scholar says this, Gideon has done little or nothing in these verses to witness to God's sovereignty. Rather, he has been arrogant, ruthlessly self-serving, and brutally vindictive. Gideon has refused to show others 
the patience that God has shown to him. It appears that Gideon has not moved from fear to faith, but rather from fear to self-assertion. Why did God reduce the number to 300? So you wouldn't trust in yourself, and yet Gideon still is. Tim Keller says this, there is a terrible spiritual danger involved in receiving any blessing. Success can easily cause us to forget God's grace because our hearts are desperate to believe that we can save ourselves. Sometimes our most dangerous battles come after our greatest victories because we think it's us that win. We lose God's grace, and vengeance is one of the ways we do that. And yet the story in its broader context teaches us something else. Vengeance is a rejection of God's grace, but God shows another way. Gideon has just won a battle, and clearly it wasn't a battle even though he's been misled to thinking so. It's not something he did. God did it. Now, why in the world is God saving a man like Gideon, who is more villain than hero? Why is he saving Israel, who again and again and again reject him? Why doesn't God say, and I will punish you with desert thorns and briars, and I will kill you? Why doesn't God execute vengeance on his people? Because God knows a deeper magic. The story of Gideon is part of the cycle of Judges. Judges 2 tells us what this story is pointing towards. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies. For the Lord had compassion on them. God's driving force is not vengeance, but compassion. And of course, that's not just the story of Gideon. That is the story, friends, of you and of me on the second Sunday of Lent. This is the story of Good Friday and Easter. Ephesians 4. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Why? Forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Vengeance is a rejection of God's grace, but when you see and receive God's grace, his compassion, we can't help but then be vessels of that compassion. As we've been forgiven, we cannot help but forgive. There is a bigger story. Not as is the man, so is his strength, but as is the Lord, so is his mercy. This December, I heard an interview with a woman named Jeannie. Jeannie, when she was younger, had been at church on a Sunday when she had a call to come to the phone, and she came to the phone, and on the other end, she heard that her sister, Nancy, and her husband, Richard, had been murdered. And Nancy would have been pregnant with her first child, her first nephew or niece. And this woman, when she heard this news, was filled, like all of us, with shock. Three months later, they caught the person who had done it. It was a young kid, an honor student at a high school, just broke into the house to take some things when this young couple came home, shot them in cold blood for no reason, had no animus against them, just killed them. He got found out because he was bragging about murdering Jeannie's sister and brother-in-law and their unborn baby, bragging about it to a friend. She was filled with anger and justice but also a desire for vengeance. For 20 years, she would not say the name of the killer. For 20 years, she could not pray for him. But then she read a book on forgiveness, and in that book, the author talked about what God had done for us in Christ, that we are to forgive as we've been forgiven. She didn't believe that, so she called the author up and asked to meet, and she met with him, and she said, how in the world can I forgive someone who still is not repentant, who still is my enemy? How can I forgive him? What does that even look like in the world? And his answer to her is what it looks like is God sending his son to hang on a cross and to pray on the cross for his murderers, Father, forgive them, they know not what they're doing. That's what it looks like. And in that moment she said her heart broke. And then she said this, I had always made a divide between Nancy's killer and me. Him, bad murderer, me, innocent victim. You see the division? Heroes, villains. The truth was there was no division between us before God. We were both flawed and fallen. There are no heroes and villains in scripture, just human beings. 
That is the truth of Lent. All of us sinners in need of a savior. And then in the interview this December, this is what she said. My faith has everything to do with my sense of justice. I love as so many people do, Micah 6 verse 8, where the prophet asked, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? And what that means to me is there is no true justice without mercy. Friends, on the second Sunday of Lent, as we journey to the cross, we journey as sinners, all of us in need of a Savior, as those who have received grace And now in this week, with all who have harmed us, are empowered to share that grace. As is the man, so is his strength. But as is the Lord, so is his mercy. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you today, each of us, with stories of how others have harmed us. Spouses, roommates, coworkers, neighbors, Father, some of these harms are petty and small and others of us have experienced deep harm, unspeakable abuse. And we come before you today longing for justice. And yet, Father, in our longings for justice, may we hear your words, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is yours, O Lord, to avenge. You will repay. Forgive us for the times we have put ourselves in your place and have gone on missions of vengeance our own. Heavenly Father, may we trust in you. And as we experience in this Lenten season your forgiveness and mercy and compassion, may we also be vessels of this mercy. We pray in Jesus' name and all of us say, amen.